Today on Wild Florida, they're well loved. I just like to watch them fly. I think they really are um, spectacular when they fly. Well fed. Let go. You've got the fish. And well, a little odd. The pout. It's weird. <laughs> but as we find out, it's not always easy being a pelican in the Sunshine State. Nearly 30% of the pelicans that we x-ray have swallowed hooks as well. I'm Hunter Reno, and this is Wild Florida. Come on, folks. If you know the pelican poem, say it with me. What a wonderful bird is a pelican. His bill can hold more than his belly can. He can hold in his beak enough food for a week, and I don't know how in the heck he can. So goes one family-friendly version of a century-old limerick honoring the brown pelican. Why a limerick? Well, you have to admit that with its enormous beak, close-set eyes, and clumsy waddle, the brown pelican is just kind of funny. Perhaps that's why it appeals so strongly to children, especially those in Sebastian, Florida. Here, pelicans are everywhere. They line the floors, they decorate the walls, they dangle from the ceiling, and of course, they sit quietly unless instructed to do otherwise. You see, at Pelican Island Elementary, all the kids Pelican. are pelicans. Deb Berg is their teacher. Our motto is Pelicans Soar. All the kids know it. Um, it helped us to learn uh, S, strive for excellence, O, own your own actions, A, act safely, and R, respect for self, environment, and others. Respect for the environment is a big thing here. After all, the school is named in honor of the country's very first national wildlife refuge, which is just down the road. In fact, last year, each and every Pelican Island student visited the refuge. What did they learn? The pelican is a bird that has a long bill and a pouch under its bill. The brown pelican is brown. They have a king-sized throat and they have no teeth. They're big and they have feathers on them. They have nine feet of wingspan. And they mostly like to eat fish and they fly around a lot. It lays eggs. Um, it sometimes has parasites on it. They have um, a, a big thing. And the babies has to have to stick their head down the, the Daddy, the dad's or mom's throat to get the food. Funny what sticks in a child's head, isn't it? Well, now that we've had a basic biology lesson, let's get down to business. There are actually seven species of pelicans in the world. The one that can be found in Florida year-round is the brown pelican. Biologist Steve Nesbitt knows that bird well. And it's the smallest pelican in the world. It's also the darkest pelican in the world. Most of the other pelicans are white. It's also the only pelican that plunge dives. The rest of them all float on the surface and catch fish that way. Our birds are small enough that they can plunge dive without breaking anything. Sure, they may hit the water without hurting themselves, but if that water's full of fishing line and fish hooks, pelicans can get into real trouble. To learn more about these pelican perils, we head from Sebastian to North Miami Beach to the Newport Beach Fishing Pier. Pier manager Nick Kiliona says he may see as many as three pelicans injured a day here in the winter. If I were a pelican, of course I would come here. Bait fish all over the place, appear to stand on and look at it. I would come here anytime. In the wild, pelicans eat nothing but small bait fish, but they'll eat whatever's available at a place like this. And sometimes they get more than they bargained for. This is what the fishermen put on the hook, and when they throw it out in the water, before you even get in the water like this, the pelican will be come swooping down and swallow the whole thing. Of course, you'll take the line, the hook, and the fish at the same time. Once a bird is hooked, he needs to get unhooked. But that's easier said than done. If you 
reel it up and try to remove the hook or at least cut the line as close to the hook as possible. That's the best thing to do. Now you've got to be careful and, and pelicans are they're fairly aggressive and they're, they've got a if you notice their bill they've got a hook on the end of their bill so they can do some damage particularly to your face and your eyes so you've got to be careful about that and that's one reason a lot of people just cut the line off and let them go because when you get them close they're flapping that bill and making all that noise and display uh, it's pretty intimidating but cutting the line can create its own set of problems one stretch of line maybe no much no more than 20 or 30 feet of line can kill five or six pelicans and you'll see them just lined up one after the other tangled in this line and dead Though most fishermen won't intentionally hurt a bird, they can get frustrated by them. But on Nick Kiliona's pier, you better not mess with the pelicans. We have a rule, you hurt the pelican, you get arrested, or you get kicked off this pier forever. That is our rule. And Nick doesn't leave the injured birds to fend for themselves. Assuming he can catch them and get them in one of these carriers, he then sends them on a short trip south to Miami, to one of the most active pelican sanctuaries in the country. I'm in the middle of Biscayne Bay, right off the 79th Street Causeway. This seems a strange place to have a bird sanctuary, but this is exactly where you'll find the Pelican Harbor Seabird Station and director Wendy Fox. Behind the Seabird Station clinic are the outdoor pens, where pelicans and other birds recovering from injuries are kept until they're healthy enough to be released. This is a great place to learn more about pelican behavior, but it's not the birds that first grab my attention. Now, Wendy, one of the things I noticed even before I got out of my car was the Ode to Pelican. <laughs> it's special, isn't it? It is, it is very powerful, very pungent. It's got a special aroma, but you can smell it from miles away. I once read something that said um, that it takes seven minutes for your nose to get used to any new kind of smell, mm -hmm. and that's my story, and I'm <laughs> sticking to it. So. Why are you located right here? We're off the 79th Street Plaza. It's so loud and busy, and there's development going on everywhere I look, but yet this is a uh, sanctuary. The Pelicans chose this place, okay? We didn't say this is the place to put it. What it is is that we're on a flyway up and down beautiful Biscayne Bay. To the Pelicans, we're just another island. And they, they're going to the fishing piers, they're going to the Rookery Islands, and they pass over here. Uh, the neat thing about it, now that we have the pens here, is yeah. because they're colonial birds and they like to be together in groups, as they're flying over, they see the birds, the wild pelicans land, and we pick up 50% roughly of the injured pelicans right here. Really? Yeah, we don't have to go and find them. They find us. You may have noticed that these pelicans don't all look the same. What do the colors mean? Well, the brown ones are the young pelicans. The more colorful pelicans, those with blue eyes and yellow or white heads, are actually the grown-ups. So guess which one is the male and which is the female? Got it? Actually, they're both males. As it turns out, males and females look alike, and both sexes will spend part of the year with a white head and part of the year with a yellow head. The yellow, it comes out in big clumps, those feathers. Oh, yeah, talk about a bad hair day. And then he's going to end up with a white head and a brown neck. Okay. okay. They repeat the cycle uh, once a year, and males and females go through the same cycle. So okay. the juveniles are actually all brown neck, all or brown creamy, with a, with creamy a brown. white chest. Absolutely. Okay. And they have brown eyes. They do. They do. They have brown eyes until they mature, which is somewhere around the age of three, four years of age. Wendy, how does it work in introducing a new injured pelican into the pens? Do you ever have problems with that? That's a really good question. We are very, very careful. Um, we kind of rotate the birds through the different pens. And the reason is, especially the young ones, okay, they kind of form these little gangs. Oh, do they? Yeah, they really do. <laughs> and sometimes if you introduce a stranger, oh, well, they don't take to that too nicely. So if we see a little group forming, we kind of split it up. Oh, what, what is that pelican doing over there with that? Oh, look at him. He's feeding the baby. Now, Males how? and females take turns feeding their chicks. That's quite aggressive feeding that I'm very <laughs> glad I'm not a pelican parent. Yeah, and they do that until the chick is old enough to fly by itself and go out and learn. But the chick looks quite big. Yeah, the chick is big, but you know, they start out the size of the palm of your hand. And that chick is about 12, 
13 weeks old. In fact, if we look at a calendar, I can give you an exact date. That chick was hatched the day before Hurricane Wilma. Oh, really? Uh-huh. And the parents just sat tight on top of the nest like a cork, and he was just fine, just great. Although pelicans may weather Mother Nature pretty well, it's man they can't tolerate. In just the two weeks before my visit, the Seabird Station took in 87 brown pelicans, 85 of which were injured by fishing line or fish hooks. These are some of the things that we take off of and out of brown pelicans. Oh my goodness. Now be careful. Yeah. This is a double treble, so this lure has two treble hooks on it. One of these hooks was actually hooked to his pouch, and the other was hooked to his head. Oh, gosh. So he, he couldn't eat. He would not have been able to eat. Now, in this case, this one, one of, the little, one of the hooks was in his wing, and the other one was in his pouch, and the pouch then was hooked to the body. Oh so he goodness. was completely twisted up. Now, they can drown that way as well if they're in the water because they can't get out. And oh, sure, sure. Yes, yeah, incredible. Now Look. this, oh. right? Tell me about that. That, that looks incredibly painful. This is not something we see very often. Thank heavens. Um, this pelican actually got hooked in the chest by this hook. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he was flying along with these two hooks dangling underneath, and they caught in a fence, and it tipped him up like that, and the bird was suspended. Oh gosh! But. A good Samaritan called us, we went and got him down, and the bird's fine. Over 90% of the injuries are caused by fish hooks and fish lines, mm -hmm. but we x-ray every pelican that comes in, okay? okay? Nearly 30% of the pelicans that we wow. x-ray have swallowed hooks as well. Really? Yeah, and these do have to come out. That is an incredible, now did this bird survive? Absolutely, if we get it in time, it's a very high survival rate. So they're very hardy birds. They are very hardy birds. Look at that picture. That's for a big belly ache. Yeah, and you see, <laughs> what you don't see can kill you. Yeah, exactly. So get that checkup. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but hooks aren't the only dangerous thing pelicans ingest. The wrong kind of fish can kill them too. Now these look like vertebrae. These are from a fish. And this is a problem that we have. Really? People think they're being kind by throwing food to the pelicans. We used to do that as kids. We used to think throwing the innards and skins and things like that, so we shouldn't be doing that at all. No, because the problem is they can swallow these bones because they've got flesh on them, so they'll slip in, but they can't mm. digest them. That's right. And as the stomach shrinks down, it stretches over these bones and it pierces them, and they'll die of peritonitis. The other problem is they can get stuck in the throat and then the pelican will starve to death because it can't eat anything else. So what kind of fish should pelicans be eating? Funny you should ask. I heard the fish truck is here and we got to go help him out. Hey there. How you doing? Great. I'm Hunter. I'm Craig. Hey nice Craig. To meet you. Can I give you a hand? Sure. Why not? Thank you. So how many pounds? of fish do you bring here weekly, Craig? About 2,000 pounds every week. 2,000? Yes, ma'am, every oh week. And what's a pelican's favorite? I would say it'd be these. These are the goggle eyes. Goggle they eyes? Get, they get about three or four different types of fish. Can we take they a look? A, yes, you can. These are the goggle eyes. And that's basically their favorite. They get a thread Whoa. herring fish. That's a goggle eye. The pelican's favorite. Sure is. Did you know that laughing gulls may hover above a pelican or even sit on his beak in hopes of stealing a fish? This behavior even has a name. It's called kleptoparasitism. How are we doing? Very good. A lot easier with two people. Got to be careful around this turn here. It's yeah. kind of tight quarters. I'll watch your side here. Thank you. Now, <laughs> Perfect. they must have known you were coming. Hey, these are my buddies. They love seeing the fish truck come. We're going to feed some of these fish to the pelicans in a bit, but first, drum roll please. It's time for a release. Wendy and Kelly are just catching one of the rehabbed pelicans that we're gonna be releasing. I've never seen a pelican release before, so I'm really excited, but first we have to band its legs, both legs, and measure its ulna and its beak. And to this pelican, 
that we're going to release had a huge Ooh. hole in his pouch. You can see it went right along there. You'd have to understand how a pelican uses his pouch to appreciate the gravity of this kind of injury. Now when a pelican dives for fish, it uses this as a fishing net and it can scoop up to three gallons of fish and water in the pouch, comes to the top, lets the water drain out and swallows the fish. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've got a hole in your fishing net, you're not, not going to fish. work now. But this guy's going to be okay. And you can see it's healed really nicely. There is just a little bit of a scab left. That's not a problem. No, so we're you. going to band him. He's flying. Everything's great about him. Before a rehabilitated bird is released, he'll receive an ID band so researchers can track him. A little bit of glue on the plastic. It can't harm the bird at all. He'll also receive what is lovingly referred to here as a meal ticket. This will fall off in about 10 days. And as long as he's got this on him and we see him out here in the feeding flock on an afternoon, we will make sure that he gets a fish. It's a way of just helping him out into the wild, kind of slower than just sticking him out there. Um, because we have a policy around here. We feed the needy and skip the greedy. <laughs> Okay. That's great. So now Kelly's going to release him. Now, you know, in the movies, you always see the big dramatic the big release. Yeah, the bird gets tossed into the air. That's not actually what happens. She's going to carefully place him on the ground and walk away from him. Okay. Good luck, 53. Says I rather like this place. Uh huh. This is all just wander around and. Oh. It's not the dramatic finale you expect. Sometimes they jump right in the bay and have a huge, big, splashy bath. It's like, ooh, those humans smell. <laughs> Get that off Get of me. Get that off of me. So where do pelicans go when they finally work up the nerve to leave the seabird station? To answer that question, we head north to Stewart to meet back up with wildlife biologist Steve Nesbitt. Today, he'll be surveying pelican rookeries on the east coast of Florida. We're going to pick our way up the coast between here and Daytona Beach looking at uh, 12 or 15 um, known nesting sites for pelicans, looking to see how many birds are there. Also looking for the possibility of new sites and seeing if any of them may be vacant or what's changed since last year. Steve will be flying today with pilot Ron Towater. Ron has been flying fish and wildlife biologists around for three years, hunting for bald eagles, bears, wading birds, you name it. I just love flying anyway and then the, you put that with the wildlife, it makes it a very, very nice uh, uh, way to earn a living. It's uh, flying around looking at the animals and looking at the environment. It's fun. Yeah, it's a way to get outside, look around, see what's going on. It's always exciting to see how the birds are doing. In any given year, there are between 35 and 45 pelican colonies, or rookeries, off the coast of Florida. Today, Steve is counting how many pairs of brown pelicans are nesting in those rookeries. In a small colony, you can count them in groups of five. But in a bigger colony, you go to, to tens and twenty-fives, and, and some of the really, really big ones, if we get a really big one, you've got to go by hundreds. We don't pretend to count every individual. What did you see on that one? About 85 pairs. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission began surveying pelican rookeries in 1968. And the reason for that was that the pelican population throughout a good portion of the bird's range in North America uh, went through a fairly major population decline due to reproductive failure. Reproductive failure that resulted from widespread use of pesticides like DDT, which according to Steve, made pelican eggs so fragile that they broke before hatching, and Endrin, which killed adult birds outright. And the one thing we've learned about pelicans is that they tend to be very sensitive to chemical contamination. And anything that may cause problems, pelicans may be the first to react to it. Yeah, there's a few pelicans right in the middle. Fortunately, Florida's brown pelican population has remained fairly stable over the last several decades. But that doesn't mean the rookeries have remained the same. This night we were looking for was abandoned, so we're just flying on north of the uh, river this time. Well, we've had a couple colonies here on, on the east coast that have gone 
uh, vacant. We're not exactly sure why they do. Sometimes the mangroves just get worn out from, you know, 30 years of nesting. The other thing that happens is sometimes a raccoon will get on the colonies, and a raccoon will eat the eggs, they'll eat the babies, they'll, they'll you know, they'll, um, they'll cause general havoc amongst the colonies, and the birds will just leave. Didn't get very many that time. Let's go back around again if you would mind. So what have they seen today? Pelicans in most of the places we expected to see them. The numbers were a little lower in some of the colonies than, than, than they have been in the past, but not shockingly so. Maybe those missing birds heard it was feeding time at the seabird station. Now, Hunter, when you're carrying a bucket of fish, you have to keep it up. Yep. And kind of your hand over it. As yep. you can see, you've got people <laughs> helping. <laughs> okay, right Incoming, away. incoming. Right. Woo! <laughs> right around here. We have to be very careful getting in and out of the gates because we, we have people some. sneaking in. Sneaking in, yes, sneaking not sneaking in. out when the food's coming. Like this gentleman behind me. They're fed twice a day here, whereas in the wild, they're opportunistic feeders. When there's fish there, they'll gorge themselves. Look at all those guys outside. Set me up. The pelicans outside are clamoring for fish because they know they're getting fed next, or at least a few of them are. But before we brave that mob, here's a fun fact. Think this little cormorant can't compete with these big-beaked birds? Think again. When it comes to nabbing fish, apparently it's not the size of the beak that matters. Let's see that one again. As you can see, this is not so much a feeding as it is a mugging <laughs> at this time of year because the water's cold and the fish are deeper and, and they have trouble. You're just going to look for anybody with a tape. Or anyone that finds you. Anyone that finds you. It's very, very difficult at this time of year. Hello. Hello. Right there in your hand is a bird that we just released. Oh, yay, there we go. This is the one that we just released. Feeding one pelican in this mob really is as hard as it looks. There we go. Did he just get something? For you. He did. OK, great. There you go, my friend. All in a day's work. Give me my hand back. Thank you. Yes. Hello. 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 Ah, free! And free is how the children here think of pelicans. Forget the fish hooks, the fishing line, the hurricanes. These kids think life would be pretty great as a brown pelican in Florida. If I were a pelican, I would be beautiful and I would fly really high into the sky. I would lay my eggs. I would hatch them, and I would protect them. I'll be funny, and I would like to play with other pelicans. Well, I would like to um, swim and duck down and eat fish. You could swim in the ponds whenever you wanted to. I would have, like, six feet of wingspan, because if you're seven, you'll probably get that much. You would always have to take care of your baby. I like fishing, so probably be fun. But it would hurt to feed my kids. I like to be um, uh, admired by people and people saying, wow, look at that pelican. Okay, folks, say it with me. Wow, look at that pelican. This program continues on the Wild Florida website. Learn more about the animals featured in the series. Discover fun facts, download multimedia elements, and more at www.wildflorida.tv. Is it good luck to get pooped on by a pelican? So I've been told in many cultures. Well, actually, what they say is bird poop, you know, and I'm not sure. In general. A pigeon's one thing, a pelican, all other issues. Thank God I love it. See? <laughs> That's the kind of bird that we feed the needy and skip the greedy. That's, That's a greedy. Right. Major funding for Wild Florida is provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging you to enjoy and preserve the natural beauty of Florida. Additional funding provided by 
The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, managing Florida's fish and wildlife resources for their long-term well-being. Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Division of Recreation and Parks, offering fun in the real Florida, Florida's state parks. Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Forestry, managing Florida's forest resources through a stewardship ethic that assures their use for future generations. Visit Florida, the state's official source for travel planning at visitflorida.com.